from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 34, recorded on March 20, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we are going to cover two recent posts by Paul. I was away last week, so we didn't get to to do one. And they both have to do with the CDC changing its COVID policy. And so the first one has CDC saying those with COVID can return to normal activities if symptoms are improving and fever, if present, has been gone for at least 24 hours. So maybe you could step back and tell us uh, what's the basis for that, Paul. So I think this makes a lot of sense, and here's why. Um, there, COVID occurs in two stages. In the first stage, virus replication is king. In the second stage, the immune response is king. So in the first stage, the virus enters your body, reproduces itself again and again and again, and that's when you're most contagious. You're usually your most contagious a day or two before you develop symptoms. Then your immune system kicks in, right? B cells make antibodies to prevent the virus from attaching to and entering cells. Cytotoxic T cells kill virus-infected cells before they can make a lot more new virus particles. The war is on. And with that, you develop symptoms. So now it's the, the fight is against your immune system versus the virus. And so as your immune system ramps up, that's when you develop symptoms. That's when your symptoms are the worst. Now, as your immune system begins to abate or lessen, and in this case, as you note, you say you had fever and now you no longer have fever, you can argue with the, what the immune system is saying is that our job is done here which is also what the Lone Ranger said, actually, at the end of the Lone Ranger cartoon uh, shows. But, and, and so at that point, you can argue reasonably that virus replication is no longer an important part of the disease process and that you're much less likely to shed infectious virus or shed certainly less infectious virus. So I think what I like about that recommendation is it tailors it to the individual because we're all different. We mm-hmm. all have different immune systems and a different capacity to rid ourselves of the virus. And so those two stages, the virus replication stage or the immune response stage, will be different for different people. So doesn't it make sense then to, to say that for the individual who's getting better and that therefore is less likely to shed virus, that they can then make that decision? And I think they added an extra level of safety, if you will, by saying that, that at that point then, when you're, you're, you're better, you're feeling better, that you can then go out into the world as long as you wear a mask for an additional five days, which I think is that sort of margin of safety. To me, that makes sense. I guess he, here's how I see this. I think a reasonable recommendation would be if you're in a high risk group, you know, over 75, immune compromised, have high risk medical conditions, um, are pregnant, and you have respiratory symptoms, test yourself. If you're, if you're COVID positive, treat yourself early with an antiviral. If you're not um, in a high-risk group, don't test yourself. Assume that you have COVID or any of these other respiratory infections and stay home if you can while you're sick. And then while you get better, then you you can go out and and preferably wear a mask for for a few days. But um, I think that really makes the most sense. I'll I'll give you another example. So I'm, I'm in Florida. And what, last time I went back up to Philadelphia, I was in the airport and there was a man walking around who um, was sweeping up in, in, along the aisles where people were waiting to get on the plane. So this is Florida. There were a lot of older people there and he had a bad cold. He was coughing. He was sneezing. <laughs> his nose was dripping. He was wiping his nose on his sleeve. And I was, I was watching him sort of walk along the aisles and watching as he got closer and closer to someone the progressive horror on their face. Um, one woman, surprisingly, actually said to him, did you test yourself? And he <laughs> said proudly, yes, and, and I was negative, which meant as far as he was concerned, I can spread any of the other viruses that I have among this population, knowing that influenza kills as many as 60,000 people a year, or parainfluenza causes 50,000 people to be hospitalized, or respiratory syncytial virus kills 
10,000 to 14,000 elderly adults every year. So people didn't like that recommendation by the CDC because they said, you know, they're saying that COVID is just like every other virus. But in many ways, it is just like every other virus, which doesn't mean that it's less important. It just means that those other viruses are also important. How did we get to the point where we treat COVID differently from other respiratory infections? Like you say, if you're COVID negative, then you're fine. It doesn't matter what you have. Well, because of 2020. I mean, we, we, this was a novel virus. Um, we had a um, blank slate in this country and in this world, and we would have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people dying a day. We had nothing. We didn't have antivirals. We didn't have vaccines. We didn't have um, monoclonal antibodies. All we had was limit human to human contact. That was a scarring year. And that left us, I think, with this notion of COVID exceptionalism, if you will, that COVID is different mm. than these other viruses. But as now we have an extremely high level of population immunity, you see that COVID is sort of settling down into what these other viruses do, which means we should take them all in an important way. I think where I feel badly for people is let's take this guy who worked at the uh, at this airport in Florida. Um, we're not very good about sick leave. I think, you know, there are some businesses that make it very tough for people to take much time off. So if that's true, you should stay home if you're sick. And, and when you feel better, then you can go out into the world. But if you can't stay home, as this man, I, let's argue, couldn't, then at least wear a mask. Now, I want to go back to this the CDC recommendation where fever has been gone for 24 hours. So taking that with what you described just earlier, are we using fever as a surrogate for high levels of virus reproduction? So fever is easy because it's measurable. I mean, it's yeah. objective. You know whether you have a fever or not. Um, I think where um, it gets less uh, objective is when you say to people when you feel better because people mm. have different uh, gradations for what they mean when they say they feel better. Yeah. But it does make sense. I mean, you feel terrible, now you're feeling better and better. Um, your fever's gone, your, your congestion is less, you're coughing less, you don't have the muscle aches, joint pains, et cetera, you feel better. I think it is fair to say that that is a surrogate for decreased viral replication. Now, what would be even better is to, to prove that. And, and not, I'm not talking about with PCR or with antigen shedding, but with actual infectious virus shedding. You can right. do those studies right. to answer that question, which will give you a better idea. But I think um, at its, it, its base, I think it does make sense to think of it that way. And you also said that you, you, you're, sh you're shedding the most virus just before or at the onset of symptoms, right? So how many days after that peak do you think, and I know we don't have the data yet, but do you think that we are shedding enough virus to transmit it? Because you could shed a one PFU in your nose and it's not going to be transmitted to anyone, right? So when, when do we, for how long do we shed enough to transmit? And I think at some level that, that depends on the person. Uh, you yeah. know, there are some people who are, are going to be much better at eliminating the virus because they have an active uh, uh, and effective immune response and others who aren't. And so I think it's hard to yeah. answer the question that way. So that's why I like trying to at least um, link it to the person individually in terms of their symptoms. Um, but again, it would be nice to have more data. But I, I did like that, even though there was a lot of people who were angry about that recommendation because they thought it was we now weren't taking COVID seriously enough and that we were just reintroducing it back into a community where that wasn't uh, wasn't the right thing to do. I, I, I do like that recommendation. I agree that we need to do studies where we measure how much infectious virus, and, and you probably know this, but the WHO recently said we could start working with SARS-CoV-2 under BSL-2 conditions. So now many labs are able to do plaque assays for infectious virus. So let's start doing it, folks. <laughs> that would be really and, nice. All right. The last part well, of this. One more thing. Just, yeah. Here's another example. So, yep. so. Um, if someone has bacterial pneumonia, severe bacterial pneumonia, and they go to the intensive care unit, so severe, complicating, necrotizing bacterial pneumonia, um, what physicians will often do is they'll treat for intravenous with intravenous antibiotics for 10 days or 14 days. There was a study done recently in Israel where what they said was, okay, we're just going to treat for two afebrile days, two days when you don't have fever, and then look at the outcome. So we're going to have this group two afebrile days, and then we're going to have the other group, which is doctors can treat as long as they normally treat, 10 days, 14 days. No difference. No difference in outcomes. So it's a thing thinking, which is that 
as your immune system abates, in that case, bacterial replication has become less important. So I, I, I like that. I think that makes more sense. I, I, so you also, in that first column, made a recommendation for young and old people who have a respiratory illness. Uh, can you repeat that for us? Well, I think, I think um, if you have a respiratory illness and you're in a high-risk group, if you're an older person or have any sort of uh, medical problems that put you at highest risk, I, I do think you should test yourself and make sure you don't have COVID. And if you do, then treat yourself. A, a young, healthy person, mm -hmm. I'm defining young as less than 75, um, who has respiratory symptoms, um, I think you don't need to test yourself. Just assume you have one of these other viruses, which can also okay. cause harm and be fair to the people around you. And that means staying home if you can or wearing a mask if you need to go out, right? Exactly. And, and that's a, a dramatic change from what we do. There are other there are countries, especially in Southeast Asia, that do wear masks in the winter when they have symptoms. We, we're not used to doing that. I think we see it as some sort of scarlet letter. We're uncomfortable with that. But it makes a lot of sense to do that. All right. The second column was about... Uh, the CDC recommendation that people 65 years of older or older should receive a second dose of the latest COVID vaccine. Uh, so what's the basis for that? Right. This has been somewhat confusing to me. When, when they originally made that recommendation, they said the word may, may receive a second dose in that first mm -hmm. year or that year. So two doses in one year, separated by at least four months. And then they changed that to should. So we went from may to should. Um, I um, understand that there are people who are over 65 who are in high risk, who, who may well benefit from that second dose in terms of preventing hospitalization, because that's what we're talking about, preventing hospitalization. I thought the data were still fairly thin in, in terms of trying to support that recommendation. And, and that's where I think the CDC can help us the most. When they make a recommendation like that, a policy like that, show the data that clearly shows that with that second dose, somebody who's over 65 benefits, because by making it a recommendation for everybody over 65, um, I find it hard to believe that everybody over 65 equally benefits, as they've shown for other booster dosing campaigns. When, when uh, Omicron first came into the country, they looked at the value of a third dose or a fourth dose in preventing hospitalization. And the third dose clearly prevented hospitalization and the fourth dose to a lesser extent, but only in high risk groups. I imagine that's true here too, but they didn't say that. They said everybody over 65. So again, I think it's a policy um, that's not um, influential in the sense that there's not clear evidence for where that policy comes from. I think the data were still small. Hopefully we'll generate more data. One of the things you point out in the uh, article is that we're, we're not going to be able to prevent infection, except maybe very shortly after immunization. So we're depending on memory, and that's a problem because it's delayed, right? Right. So, so um, if you're trying to prevent mild infection, the best way for that to happen is to have high levels of virus-specific neutralizing antibodies in your circulation at the time of exposure. But antibodies fade. So three to six months later, those levels will decrease. And therefore, once again, you're going to be susceptible to mild disease. I mean, that's my story. I had a third dose of vaccine um, in uh, six months before I got a natural COVID infection, because by then my antibodies had faded. This was after a third dose. Um, but, but protection against severe disease is mediated by immunological memory cells. And the reason that's true is it takes a while to develop severe disease seven days, 10 days, 14 days. That's plenty of time for activation and differentiation of memory cells, like memory B cells to make antibodies or memory cytotoxic T cells to make effector uh, killer cells. Plenty of time for your immune system to do that to prevent you from having severe disease. And the good news about memory cells, unlike antibodies, is they're generally long-lived, which is why protection against severe disease can be long-lived, but protection against mild disease would be short-lived. In your column, you bemoan the lack of data <laughs> supporting uh, multiple booster doses. And you, you talk about what we would need to make it clear. So what, what has to be done to provide uh, good support for a vaccine plan? Right. Most people in this country have probably had three doses of vaccine mm -hmm. or at least two doses in a natural infection. And so it's a whole range of people. It's healthy people less than 75. It's people with various different 
high-risk medical conditions. It's people with various degrees of immune compromise. It's people who are pregnant. It would be nice to know over time how long those memory cells appear to be lasting, which is to say keeping you out of the hospital. So I had three doses of a vaccine and one natural infection. I actually haven't had a booster dose um, beyond, beyond Wuhan. I mean, my third dose, my booster dose was Wuhan one, mm -hmm. the ancestral strain. So I haven't had the Omicron booster doses. How long am I, for how long am I protected against severe disease? For how long are each of those groups protected against severe disease? Is it two years, five years, 10 years? And it would be nice also, and this isn't easy, but it would be nice also to pair those epidemiological studies with academic immunological studies to look at to the degree to, that, to which that correlates with the frequency of memory B cells or memory T cells? Those are answerable questions. And so we need to answer them. I think we do um, lack from a um, comprehensive national health system, which is why sometimes it's easier to get those data in Canada or the UK or Israel, which have national health systems. But, but we can answer those questions. And I think it's incumbent upon us to answer those questions. Do, how long will my memory cells last? Am I protected for the next two years, five years, 10 years? I think that's, a, that's an answerable question. Yeah, it's a long-term study that requires some investment, right? Right. So uh, as for you, Paul, you're not planning to get a Omicron-like booster at this time. Is that right? I think if I had 75, I will, <laughs> I will do that. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't get um, the, uh, the, uh, the original bivalent vaccine, you know, the, the uh, Omicron plus BA4, BA5. I didn't get the um, XBB1.5 vaccine. So, um, but because I don't think I need it. I mean, my reading of the literature is that if you've had three doses or two doses in a natural infection, you're otherwise healthy. And at least in my case, not young, but not terribly old, that you know that you are appear to be protected against severe disease. We'll see, we'll see. We'll see. Who needs boosters and how often? If you tested positive next week, you would most likely take Paxlovid, right? Yes, definitely. And that would save your life and prevent severe disease. So that at least in countries where that's available, that should be part of the plan. Right, and, and is, is very much underutilized. I mean, I think a large percentage of people who are hospitalized and die, who are in high-risk groups, often don't take an antiviral early in their illness. That is preventable. We, we talk endlessly about booster dosing, but so what, what all those four groups that I mentioned have in common is, is they may not make a very good immune response. I mean, my mother is 95, she got a booster dose. I don't think she's likely making a very good immune response. It's, but she would much more benefit from an antiviral. Yeah, as you, as you know from listening to Daniel Griffin's clinical update, often the physician says, let's wait and see. And that's not a good plan. No, you want, it, you want to get it in that viral replication stage because you're giving something that inhibits viral replication. That's, that's right. You don't want to wait till later. You can find Paul Offit at Beyond the Noise on Substack. We'll have a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.